that it was composed by a woman who was barely 18. This is just something else, it's something incredible. So um, I will try to delve into this novel, uh, telling you what the main features are, what uh, uh, caused Mary Shelley also to think of something so strange and unusual for us, but it wasn't so strange and unusual in our times. And uh, then I will ask you to ask me questions because uh, I very much like interacting with students so, so if you have any difficulty or any question, any curiosity, please do not hesitate. I really enjoy talking to you. So um, I am sure you're all familiar with the plot of Frankenstein. So I will not delve into that. But uh, um, I will try to explore two different strands that in the novel are completely interlaced and uh, uh, caused Mary Shelley to write the novel. The first one is the autobiographical strand because uh, uh, Mary Shelley was uh, uh, very much influenced by the events of her life uh, that she projected onto paper in Frankenstein. And the second one is the scientific debate of our times. That is also a pivotal influence on her life and on her works, not just Frankenstein, but uh, virtually all her vast output because people tend to forget that Mary Shelley wrote many other works, many other novels, narratives, a travelogue after Frankenstein. She basically wrote until um, 1844 because after that, from 1844 until the time she died in 1851, she was too sick to uh, compose anything. She had a brain tumor, as you probably know, and therefore it was too painful and too difficult for her to write. But first of all, let's talk about the autobiography. And also the autobiographical strands are multiple. First of all, the novel explores the limit the boundary between life and death, a boundary that Mary Shelley herself explored unwillingly uh, since the very moment she was born. Because you know that uh, when Mary Shelley was born, uh, her mother got sick due to complications connected with her pregnancy, and then she died something like 10, 11 days later. So life and death are mingled, are, uh, you know, uh, difficult to distinguish from the very birth of the writer. And from that moment onward, she was haunted by the idea of death and by the uh, deep wish to bring back loved ones to life. Um, one dream she had uh, just before composing Frankenstein probably influenced her very much when she wrote the novel. You probably know that uh, uh, she had uh, a very intimate relationship with Percy Shelley, who at that stage was still a married man. But uh, she eloped with him uh, together with Claire Clermont. They went to France, uh, then they came back. Uh, and uh, before 1816, actually, they had uh, a first child, uh, this baby girl who died uh, shortly after her, uh, her birth. And uh, we don't know why she died, uh, probably, uh, I don't know, some congenital illness, uh, but she died uh, something like one week after she was born. And uh, obviously it was a shock for Mary Shelley, who was uh, very young, a very young woman, a very young lady at that stage. So she dreamt one night that uh, um, she carried this baby girl next to the fire where she was. And she dreamt that this fire 
could, with a spark, revive her baby girl. So uh, this concept of the spark of life, which is very much present in the novel, uh, actually came from this dream. This dream that uh, uh, voiced uh, her outmost ambition, that is to defeat death. Then, from the autobiographical point of view, we also have another important strand. Uh, you know that uh, Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley were uh, intimate with Lord Byron. Uh, in actual fact, uh, uh, when Mary Shelley started to compose Frankenstein, they were not so intimate. They were just uh, barely acquaintances. And uh, um, in actual fact, uh, um, it's uh, due to Claire Clermont, who was in love with Byron and by whom she had a baby girl, um, Allegra, who died in Italy. Uh, it's thanks to Claire Clermont that uh, they decided, the three of them, to go on the shores of the uh, lake in Geneva and uh, spend the summer of uh, 1816 there with Byron, with Matthew Gregory Lewis, who is the author of The Monk, another important Gothic novel, and with John Polidori, who at that stage was uh, the, um, the doctor of Lord Byron. So uh, this, this group of friends uh, gathered there had the, the weirdest summer. That summer was actually known as the summer without summer because it rained and rained and rained and rained incessantly for many, many, many days. And obviously they couldn't go out, they couldn't enjoy the lake, they couldn't do anything that they wanted to do because uh, it was raining all the time. And it was raining all the time because the Tambora volcano uh, in uh, uh, Indonesia actually had burst. And all the ashes uh, of the volcano with the wind had moved uh, westward towards Europe. And therefore, the, the sky was always clouded, there was always mist in the air, ashes in the air, and rain, rain, rain. So uh, they were indoors all the time, and they started reading some ghost stories, in, uh, collected in a volume entitled Phantasmagoriana. It was a collection of uh, uh, German stories translated into French. Uh, and Lord Byron had a brilliant idea, or he thought it was a brilliant idea. He said, why don't we do the same? Why don't we take the opportunity, since we cannot go out, since we cannot do anything, let's create the opportunity to write each of us a story. And uh, let's see who will win, who will produce the most terrifying story of all. And uh, everybody immediately started writing, started working. Mary Shelley uh, started writing Frankenstein and uh, uh, Percy Shelley uh, started to write a couple of poems, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, they were not uh, uh, successful and uh, uh, he didn't even finish them. And Lord Byron wrote uh, Manfred. Manfred was uh, um, uh, a play, okay, a, a theatrical play, and uh, he wrote part of Manfred while he was in Geneva, and the rest of Manfred was written later on. Eventually, the story was published uh, in uh, 1817. Uh, the setting is multiple. There is Switzerland, and Switzerland is also present in Frankenstein. There are many, many similarities. Um, Polidori started writing uh, a short story, uh, and this short story uh, is entitled The Vampire. Uh, the Vampire was uh, a short story which actually featured um, uh, 
Lord Byron as the vampire, uh, as a weird master who um, sucked up all the energy from the people around him. So he was not a flattering version of Lord Byron. But the only one who actually finished the story, even though it was always difficult for her to write, was Mary Shelley. And uh, um, it was difficult for her to write. And in fact, uh, in the preface uh, to Frankenstein, you find an anecdote uh, narrated by the writer herself, uh, who says that basically every day Shelley used to go to her and say, have you thought of a story? Have you thought of a story? Have you started writing your story? And she would say, no, 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 no. But eventually she is the only one who finished finished uh, her task. And therefore, Frankenstein is part of this uh, um, wonderful uh, uh, bet, a literary bet, and Mary Shelley obviously uh, won. Uh, talking about the uh, biographical strands of uh, um, Frankenstein, there is also another thing that I want to mention to you. Um, Frankenstein, as you are probably aware of, is a story that deals with uh, the complicated relationship between fathers and children. Uh, the very same complicated relationship Mary Shelley had with William Godwin. Uh, we know that Godwin, when Mary Wollstonecraft died, considered himself a, a truly unfit father, unfit for his task, because he didn't know how to handle this child. And Mary Shelley was not the only child in the household because um, Mary Wollstonecraft had also had a previous pregnancy and a previous child with uh, an American soldier, uh, Gilbert Imlay. And uh, um, the child was the ill-fated uh, uh, Fanny. Uh, who died, she committed suicide uh, um, around uh, 1817. And uh, therefore, uh, William Godwin decided to uh, marry another woman, uh, her, his next door neighbor, uh, the mother of Claire Clermont, in actual fact, and uh, uh, decided to leave to her the education of uh, uh, her daughters. But the only relationship Mary Shelley had with her father was an intellectual relationship. Uh, Godwin was enthralled by the intelligence of Mary uh, because he also believed that uh, she uh, would be a, a truly intelligent girl since she was the daughter of himself and Mary Wollstonecraft, the two most important intellectuals of the times. Uh, so he he wanted to prove that uh, his girl was extremely intelligent and therefore he tested her and uh, uh, he tried uh, to uh, stimulate her intelligence. Uh, Mary Shelley um, basically had to read uh, five, six, seven books at the same time and every evening her father would question her on the plots, on what uh, she had understood. Uh, so uh, it was a very complex relationship, the one between father and daughter. But uh, uh, what you may not know is that at a certain stage, um, Godwin's new wife uh, uh, resented the presence of Mary because Mary was a constant living reminder of the fact that she was not the lady of the household because uh, she was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Wollstonecraft was a looming presence in the household. And therefore she prompted Godwin to send uh, her da his daughter away. And uh, um, his daughter was sent away um, to Scotland, uh, to the Baxter family. And uh, uh, the excuse, the official excuse was the fact that uh, Mary Shelley suffered from a skin disease that could be treated more effectively uh, in, uh, um, in Scotland. But obviously, uh, Godwin just wanted to send his daughter away 
to please his new wife. And therefore, uh, he suffered very much this kind of uh, uh, abandonment on the part of her father. She felt abandoned, she felt exposed. She started writing letters to Godwin and initially he replied, but uh, in the end he never did anymore. And uh, therefore, uh, not to miss him too much, uh, she decided to write her own letters as if he had written them to her. So it is a very tender moment in Mary Shelley's life. She, she wanted to, to pretend that her father still loved her and uh, that, uh, I mean, he was there for her, but he wasn't, he wasn't. And uh, therefore, um, this idea of the father that neglects his child, his creature, is infused in Frankenstein. You know that uh, uh, all the fathers uh, in the story are negative figures. Uh, Frankenstein's father himself actually mocked him instead of explaining to him why he deemed uh, the works by um, uh, alchemists wrong. So uh, he was um, not an understanding father, not a cooperative father, not a father that would look after his child. And therefore, this is the first negative father. Then Victor himself, uh, uh, towards the creature, was the worst father ever because he abandoned the creature. Uh, first of all, he created him uh, the way he created him, uh, you know, by stitching together uh, parts that came from animals, that came from uh, um, people, uh, snatching bodies uh, in the graveyards uh, or in the slaughterhouses. Uh, so he knew that uh, uh, the outcome of his folly would be a monster. He couldn't imagine otherwise. But then when he gave him life and he saw how monstrous the creature actually was, he abandoned him. So the creature originally was a very good living being. Um, he fed on berries. He didn't want to harm any creature. He didn't feed on animals. Uh, so the creature is vegetarian, actually, uh, throughout the novel. Uh, he helped the little girl that fell into the lake, but he was repaid with ingratitude, with uh, hatred, with uh, violence by the people. And therefore, uh, he took his revenge, but simply because people misbehaved with him. Otherwise, he would have been a gentle, loving creature throughout his life. So the relationship between father and child is of exceptional importance in Frankenstein. And uh, uh, if you understand this, if you understand that Mary Shelley actually projected herself onto the creature, you will understand better the work. Mary Shelley, uh, incidentally, also projected herself into Victor Frankenstein because she felt that she was not a perfect creator herself. Uh, from the point of view of intellectual creativeness, because she felt that in comparison with Percy Shelley or with her father, she was not intelligent enough, she was not good enough, she was not talented enough, but also in relationship to her creative ability as a woman. Because uh, apart from the little girl who died, uh, the first uh, born uh, of Mary and Percy, uh, Mary Shelley had other pregnancies and they were never uh, carried out uh, um, in a positive way because uh, William eventually died 
in um, in Italy and so Clara Verina and then she had other miscarriages abortions so she had uh, uh, very much difficulty in procreating so the idea of being an imperfect creator just like Victor haunts the mind of Mary so Mary is at the same time projected onto the creature and projected onto Victor Frankenstein so this is uh, the uh, biographical and autobiographical element in the text. Now I'm going to uh, delve into the scientific aspect. Hmm. You know that uh, in those days, uh, um, science and literature were not disjoined. Uh, now we think of scientists as uh, people who are completely different from uh, um, uh, literary people. Uh, it's, it's very difficult that uh, we uh, cultivate both literature and uh, the liberal arts and science. It is unique, it's very rare. But uh, this was not the case in the time uh, of Mary Shelley. In Mary Shelley's time, it was normal. Um, Godwin himself uh, cultivated science. Percy Shelley in his uh, uh, dorm uh, while he was at Eton first and then at Oxford was full of uh, files and uh, um, uh, chemical uh, components and uh, uh, there is a huge description of his studium by um, Hogg, Thomas Hogg, who was his friend, and uh, he described uh, uh, Shelley's office room as if it was uh, the room of a scientist. Um, Percy Shelley was fond also of these sections. Uh, you may think it very weird, but in those days, uh, people would go uh, to the operating theater, which is called a theater because people would go there as if you went to a theater. You would go to the operating theater and uh, uh, observe uh, these sections, these sections of bodies. And uh, at times, he would also go there with, with Mary. So they would spend time in, uh, in there, uh, in uh, the dissection room. And uh, I mean, uh, for us it is weird, but for them it was perfectly in order, perfectly normal. Um, in addition to that, uh, um, there was a society, a sort of club in those days that was called uh, um, the Lunar Society. It was called the Lunar Society because people met every full moon in the house of one of the members. The full moon because they met at night, uh, there was no electricity, and therefore with the full moon it was easier for the people to move around and find their way. Uh, in the Lunar Society, uh, literary people, scientists, and people who cultivated both uh, gathered and exchanged opinions. Godwin was a member, Mary Shelley was a member, Percy Shelley was a member, and also a Erasmus Darwin. Erasmus Darwin was the great grandfather, the grandfather actually of Charles Darwin, and uh, the author of The Temple of Nature, uh, which is a work in which he explained through liter literature and literary metaphors, he explained uh, the, um, the life of plants and botany. So um, in, in this club, uh, they would uh, talk about uh, literature, they would talk about uh, the most recent scientific developments, uh, and uh, uh, Mary Shelley for sure got some hints on the scientific debates in the lower society. And talking about the scientific debates, uh, I have to mention, to mention um, a dispute two disputes actually. The one between vitalists and materialists and another dispute between evolutionists and creationists. And both disputes actually influenced Mary Shelley while she was uh, composing Frankenstein. But let me talk about the first one, the dispute between um, 
vitalists and materialists. Okay, um, the vitalists actually believed that uh, uh, life was not made only of matter, of uh, flesh. I mean, they believed that in flesh uh, in, there was life infused, this spark of divine life, something divine that actually could uh, um, turn uh, a piece of flesh into uh, a living being. And this was important. And uh, so um, these vitalists uh, uh, who were headed by uh, Dr. Abernethy uh, so uh, believed that God had an influence uh, on people's lives, that without God's influence, uh, people's life did not exist. On the other hand, materialists, materialists actually believed that uh, we are only matter, we are only substance. There is no, uh, I mean, no other... Uh, element, uh, I mean, uh, we are matter, uh, there is no God, there is nothing else involved. And uh, uh, therefore, um, you just need to find the key to revive a living being. And if you find, if you manage to find the key, then you will be able to revive a, a, a human being. So uh, it's just a matter of finding how. It's just a matter of finding the mechanism that regulates life. Once you find it, then you're done. You, you have found the secret of life. There is no other secret of life than the key to life. And uh, uh, so, um, actually, uh, Percy Shelley belonged to this category because uh, he believed that you just have to find the mechanism. And if you find the mechanism, you will be able to revive a corpse. And this is what we find in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, because this is exactly this, uh, the key the spark of life, which in Mary Shelley's case is electricity, and the spark of life will turn a corpse into a living being. And that's it. Um, the other dispute that I mentioned is the dispute between evolutionists and creationists. Evolutionists behave, believed that uh, we just evolve as uh, living creatures, we evolve, and uh, uh, the task of a doctor is just to observe the evolution. Uh, doctors should not intervene to alter what the normal, natural status of things is. So we should not interfere. Creationists, on the other hand, believe that we must interfere, that we can actually perfect nature, that all the faults that are typical of being human, with time, with the development of science, could be overcome. So this is what, this is what he believed. And Adam Walker who was uh, Percy Shelley's doctor, actually was uh, um, influenced by the creationists and he influenced Percy Shelley in turn and Percy Shelley influenced Mary Shelley. So you can uh, uh, recognize uh, uh, in Victor Frankenstein a materialist in the first place, and then a creationist, somebody that believed that you can manipulate nature, that you can alter nature. In addition to this, Mary Shelley was also very much familiar with other experiments of the time. 
And uh, uh, one of the most interesting experiments was the experiment of Luigi Galvani. Luigi Galvani was a doctor and uh, in 1791, more or less, he performed uh, an experiment on animal electricity. So he wanted to prove that inside every living creature, there is some form of electricity uh, that circulates. And therefore, even if you die, if you find the way to revive the electricity that circulates in our body, then you can um, uh, basically turn uh, everything that is dead into life. Um, so, um, Galvani made an experiment with frogs. Uh, he killed a frog, the frog was dead, and then he applied some electrodes on the legs of the frog, which immediately started moving but this this way. And uh, so he uh, somehow connected life with electricity. This is why in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, everything happens during a thunderstorm. And this is why in popular culture, but not in the novel, in popular culture, the creature is revived through electricity because Galvani made this experiment. Um, this experiment was also followed by um, his nephew, um, actually, um, his name was Giovanni Aldini. Giovanni Aldini decided to um, basically um, bring to perfection the experiment of Galvani. Um, and uh, he wanted to uh, experiment on uh, creature, on living beings, on, on men, on women, on human beings. He was not happy with frogs, he was not happy with animals. But uh, since he lived in Italy, and in Italy uh, experimenting on corpses was forbidden by the Catholic religion, he decided to move to England. Because I don't know whether you're aware of that, if you were a prisoner and you were either sentenced uh, in Newgate prison or you died in Newgate prison, then immediately your body was given away to science and people could experiment on your body. So um, basically, um, Aldini went to England, went to London, and uh, in 1803, uh, when George Foster was sentenced to death, he took his body, he applied electrodes, and he noticed that in actual fact, this body moved. This body um, uh, actually uh, had uh, some, some uh, muscular, uh, uh, interaction with uh, uh, the environment. The legs moved, he performed many other experiments and people were present, probably, probably Godwin was present to this uh, experiment and he narrated the experiment to Mary and Percy Shelley. Um, so according to um, many witnesses, uh, bodies had actually stood up and even moved, walked, but uh, as soon as the electricity was gone, uh, then the body would collapse and uh, the corpse would uh, go back to his uh, inertia. But for sure, this very much influenced Mary Shelley in her uh, speculation, because uh, uh, this is what happens to the creature. Uh, other elements of contemporary times that influenced Mary Shelley were the explorations, the Arctic explorations. Um, Captain Burney, 
in 1817 had actually explored uh, the North Pole and had written a lengthy report that possibly Mary Shelley had consulted. Because you know that uh, uh, the frame story of uh, uh, Frankenstein is actually set in the North Pole and uh, um, there is this uh, frame narrative in which Walton, the explorer, goes to the North Pole Paul and uh, it is there that he meets Victor. Victor that is uh, chasing after the creature, the creature that is escaped to the north. So Arctic exploration. Uh, then Mary Shelley was also influenced by her reading list of the period. Um, her reading list included the works by Humphrey Davy. Humphrey Davy was uh, a scientist who also made experiments on electricity. And uh, uh, she was also influenced by Coleridge, Kubla Khan, and uh, most of all, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which is uh, quoted uh, explicitly at the beginning of Frankenstein. Then she was also uh, influenced by Alessandro Volta's experiments on the pile, uh, also creating a pile, electricity, the north and the south poles of the pile corresponding to the north pole and the south pole of the globe. So there were many, many influences on Mary Shelley together with uh, her autobiography. Uh, I would like to conclude my talk on Frankenstein by uh, giving you some uh, hints on another aspect that I find particularly intriguing in the novel. That is uh, the portrayal of women in the text. We know that Mary Shelley was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft was the very first important feminist in England. So um, this aspect must have played an influence on Mary Shelley, and indeed it did. Um, she wanted to reflect on the fact that women are somehow harmless. They cannot defend themselves. And why cannot they defend themselves? Why cannot they support themselves? Because they have had no culture, no education. So Frankenstein is also uh, the way Mary Shelley uses to denounce, to report, to censor uh, the impressionistic education of women in her times. Uh, take, for example, uh, Elizabeth Lavenza. Elizabeth Lavenza, who is the same age as Victor, who is raised as if she were his sister and then she will be uh, his wife. But Elizabeth's education, if compared to education of Victor, is just useless. Uh, she is taught how to sing, how to play, she reads a poem every now and again, but there is no assiduous education, no plan in her education. Uh, whereas for Victor Frankenstein, there is a plan, there are tutors, he's tutored in all the subjects, scientific as well as literary subjects, which is not the case with um, Elizabeth. And this is the reason why she eventually uh, cannot speak for herself, cannot defend herself. She is, uh, um, you know, just a puppet in the hands first of Victor and then of the creature who prevents her from even shouting in her own defense when he kills her on a wedding night. And uh, another instance of this is Justine, Justine, Justine Morris. Justine Morris, who is uh, um, considered uh, uh, unjustly so as the um, killer of uh, William. William is uh, um, 
Victor's uh, uh, brother. And uh, Justine cannot defend herself. Eventually, she even confesses what she had not committed. Uh, she confessed a lie. She confessed that she had killed uh, William, even though she hadn't. But simply because she was not able of defending herself, she uh, was not able of uh, protecting herself from the manipulation of the priest who wanted her to confess. And when Elizabeth tries to defend her, her harangue is completely useless because in the same way as she cannot defend herself, she cannot defend also her friend. To prove also um, women's uh, uh, uselessness in the novel, I want to quote also um, the fact that uh, um, the female creature is eventually not even built by Victor Frankenstein. So Victor Frankenstein builds a male creature, but he cannot push himself to build a female creature. So the female creature is eventually dumped in the water of the Orkney Islands uh, without even being alive for five minutes. So women are useless. They cannot even be considered monsters. They're not even that. The last, the very last thing I want to tell you about, uh, talking about the novel, is um, a remark on the structure and the final part of the novel. Um, I mentioned that there is a frame narrative, but uh, Frankenstein can be read as a story within a story within a story, like Chinese boxes or Russian dolls. I mean, there is the story of Walton going up to the North Pole, and this is the level of reality, because actually people went to the North Pole for explorations. Then there is an inside box, and this inside box is the box of possibility, the possibility of creating uh, out of uh, dead matter creating a new life which as I mentioned before was the dream of materialists and creationists and then there is a story with another story within another story uh, which is the story of uh, uh, the creature himself narrated by himself which is the level of impossibility because it's it's impossible that um, a creature that is not even alive can narrate a story but it's interesting so you see that there is this box within a box within a box and uh, the structure is like the structure of dante's inferno uh, you uh, the further down you go uh, the closer you become to the nightmare. As for the final part of the story, uh, Mary Shelley had thought of a different final for this novel. Uh, you know that Mary Shelley was fond of the creature. Uh, the creature was a projection, projection of herself. And uh, uh, she never called him fiend demon. It is Percy Shelley, when he revised Mary Shelley's novel, that he inserted the words uh, uh, demon, fiend, uh, monster. He never used these words. She always called uh, uh, the creature wretched. Wretched because it was a wretched creature. It was just uh, an abandoned child, abandoned by his father. And uh, also the final part was different because in the final part, uh, uh, the way it is now, uh, we gather that the creature will die. The creature will commit suicide. He will throw himself into a funeral pyre. But uh, this was not the case in Mary Shelley's original novel, because in Mary Shelley's original novel, uh, the creature would simply move away and uh, be lost to the sight of Walton. So uh, she actually, uh, in this final part, fulfilled what she wished for her novel, uh, which is what you read uh, at the very end of the introduction. At the very end of the introduction, you find these words, go forth and prosper. This is exactly what she wanted for a creature, and this is exactly what she wrote 
in the final part before Percy Shelley's changes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I don't know whether you have questions or things that you would like to ask me. I would like to have some interaction with you. Something that you would like me to expand more on. Come on, don't be shy. You can write it in the chat box. So let me see whether, yes, there is a chat box. Okay. Please. Tamoy. Okay, Frank Fenn is a story of romantic quest. Hmm, that's an interesting question. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, we know that uh, uh, all the romantics were uh, looking for something beyond. And uh, for sure, Frankenstein uh, is a story in which uh, basically all the protagonists try to overcome the limits, overcome the limits between uh, uh, life and death, overcome the limits between what is licit for a man or a woman to do and what is not. So for sure, it is a story of romantic quest. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. How is the theme of societal rejection being employed in the said novel? Yes, um, talking about uh, the creature himself, because uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the creature is originally good. Uh, even in the way he um, pampers and looks after the, the lazy family. Uh, he uh, collects the wood for them, he brings them food, uh, he does everything, everything he can for them. Uh, so uh, he is good. Uh, he rescues the little girl who has fallen into the lake, but then as society uh, judges people by the appearance only, uh, he is rejected by society itself. And therefore he becomes the monster that everybody wants him to be. So societal rejection is at the base of Frankenstein. And uh, this goes in harmony with uh, what Mary Shelley had read in Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, The Social Contract. Um, the creature is uh, uh, the epitome of the good wild man, the good savage. The good savage, which is uh, a nice person, uh, is uh, is good, and uh, uh, and then um, the society actually corrupts him because uh, society judges by the appearance, and uh, all the kindness of the creature is repaid with anger, hatred, uh, uh, prejudice, and hostility. Thank you for the question, Nisha. Thank you, ma'am. Who, who is the real monster? Is Victor or is the real monster? Uh, um, I think that Mary Shelley wanted to, to, um, to tell readers, her readers, that anybody could be a monster if the circumstances uh, uh, actually turn him into one. Uh, the creature would have never been a monster had he been treated uh, uh, gently. Victor uh, was not supposed to be a monster, but he is a monster because of his pride. He wanted to be like God. Uh, there is a passage in the novel in which he says that he wants to create a new species. And this species will treat him as a god. So um, this is uh, how Victor himself is turned into a monster. 
but everybody can be a monster. A monster is also Walton, because Walton knows that his expedition is very dangerous, but because of his pride, because he wants to excel, because he wants to be the first one who visited the North Pole and found a passage north, he exposes uh, all his crew to terrible dangers. So everybody can be a monster if everybody um, surrenders to his or her passions. Because you should realize that the word passion actually comes from Latin, patio, which means to be subject to something. So in, uh, instead of dominating yourself, you are dominated by a passion, then for sure you become a monster. Thank you for the question, Soma. Thank you, ma'am. Come on, any other curiosity, things that you want to ask me about Mary Shelley in general, other works, uh, whatever you want. Romanticism, other romantic writers, uh, just uh, take the chance. Come on. Don't be shy. Come on. Other things that you would like me to explain to you. I would be very happy to answer. So, okay, ma'am, as they are uh, feeling, uh, I think, uh, feeling lazy, I would say. <laughs> so, so uh, let me ask uh, a question, not a question, actually. Uh, so, on their behalf, uh, I like to uh, know this. Actually, uh, what do you think? What is the real message that uh, through this novel uh, we get? Uh... Okay, there are many, many messages, I think. Uh, one of the most important messages is that uh, um, you have to take into consideration the effects of what your of what you do the effects of your actions so uh sometimes people uh, behave uh, without taking into account what the result of his or her actions will be uh, here mary shell is teaching us to think and be wise i mean what you do is not what you do in that moment what you do as a resonance uh, as a, a, a result and uh, will produce uh, other uh, things in the future. So always take into consideration uh, everything you do because that is important. And another thing, another thing um, is also the kindness. Uh, this is also something that Mary Shelley uh, was 
very much interested in. The fact that you always have to be kind. You have to be kind with the other human beings, with other creatures, with the planet, with the plants, with animals. Because if you treat everything gently, then there will be no uh, backlash. Otherwise, there will be a huge backlash. And this is what Mary Shelley, for example, taught us in The Last Man, which is another novel, uh, which I strongly advise you to read, a novel published in 1926, in which there is a pandemic. And the pandemic has been actually uh, caused by human greed, by the fact that men want to exploit the planet, exploit nature, exploit plants, uh, there is pollution, we don't take into consideration the long-term uh, effects of um, uh, industrialization. So this is very important. So Mary Shell is always teaching us to be wise, is always uh, uh, encouraging us to think deep to think of the consequences of everything we do. This is what I believe is the most important message of the novel. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, another uh, 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 query I do have. Uh, when we see that after uh, Victor Frankenstein, he dedicates himself to the practice of, to the studies of life, death, natural science, natural philosophy, he neglects his own health, own family. Mm -hmm. So is not it ironic, do you think, that in, uh, he is studying life and death, but he does not realize the cost of his own family, own life, own health? On life. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So Mary Shell is teaching us that excesses should not be followed. If you exceed, you, you should always have a balance in life. If you exceed and you focus too much, even on your profession, on your job, but then you neglect everything else. And uh, I mean, uh, he uh, creates uh, an abomination because uh, uh, he is so uh, obsessed by his idea of uh, fulfilling his ambition that he doesn't take into consideration anything else. And uh, uh, Victor is also a coward because when it comes to Justine Moritz, uh, he knows that she is innocent. He knows that the creature killed William, yet... Uh, he is silent. He is silent because if he revealed the fact that the creature had killed William, then he would reveal the fact that he has been a, an abominable and inconsiderate creator. So to protect himself, he does not hesitate to uh, make other people vulnerable. Even Elizabeth, because in actual fact, the creature had told him, unless you make me a companion, I will be there with you on your wedding night. So he knew that the creature had told him. And uh, I mean, he doesn't want to create something ugly. He doesn't want to create something abominable, something else abominable. So he is willing to sacrifice his own wife. For Hello. That. Yes. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you, Jamoy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes. Yes, sir. So much. Kalyan, please. Kalyan, yes, do you want to ask a question? Am I audible? Or ma'am is not audible? Yes, you are. You are, you are, you are. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, Hello, you are audible. Ma'am, can I uh, consider Frankenstein as a modern novel? It is a modern novel. Absolutely, it is a hmm. modern novel. All the novels by Mary Shelley are modern. Because if you think also uh, of the science in our times, uh, also genetical modifications, I mean... It is very, very easy to go from something good and positive for humanity 
to something that will eventually destroy humanity. So it is a novel that still nowadays makes us ponder on our limits. This is the most important message. We have to think of our limits. We have to think that everything we do bears consequences. And if we don't take into consideration these consequences, the whole of humanity will pay. So it is a modern novel. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. There is another question. Is Victor's overindulgence in science uh, leads him down the path to self-destruction? Yes, he is obsessed. As we said before, uh, he's not just overindulgent. He is also obsessed and uh, uh, narcissistic in a way because he wants to prove that he can be as good as God, as the creator. He doesn't acknowledge the fact that the creator is superior to himself. So he is narcissistic. It's not just overindulgent. And this actually, yes, brings him down to the path of self-destruction. Ma'am, we should, why should we read Frankenstein? Well, first of all, it's a beautiful novel. So for the pleasure of reading it. But then for all these messages, uh, you can really learn a lot, not just of 19th century, but also of modern times. So you, you really should. Don't, don't watch films on Frankenstein because uh, they are manipulations and uh, they pursue different agendas. Uh, read the novel. The novel is much better. Ma'am, uh, when you read the novel, uh, we get to know that uh, among many themes, the theme of the nature versus nurture. Hello? Yes, I can hear. Yeah. So nature versus nurture, as uh, that same theme that we get in Tempest also. So when we see the change in Frankenstein, he was something before and now he is different. He, he is no, no, no longer benevolent. So how does this change, uh, you think, it uh, affect, it, it reflects the, the theme nature versus nurture? Okay, so you're talking about the, the, the creature, not Frankenstein or Frankenstein. Sorry, creature, yeah, creature. Creature, yeah. The creature, because the creature becomes some kind of mirror. He reflects with this behavior the way people behave with him. So he is kind, is generous, but he is confronted with animosity and hatred. And therefore, he mirrors the hatred of people. That's it. I'm looking at the other questions in the chat. Why did Frankenstein create the monster quote? Uh, uh, what do you mean? Okay. Um, let me let me elaborate on this. In a way, uh, you used uh, a correct word, the idea of monster quote, because uh, uh, the monster becomes, uh, the creature becomes uh, a metaphor also for uh, Mary Shelley's own incapability as a creator. Uh, it is as if the novel was made by bits and pieces of other works. Uh, the way the creature is made of bits and pieces of other living creatures. So it is a monster quote. So very acute observation. Um, I'm reading Avapita. Uh, it's both romantic novel and a gothic horror novel. Yes, yes, it is. But there is one big difference between the, a gothic novel and Frankenstein. And this is what prevents us from uh, uh, considering Frankenstein as a straightforward gothic novel. Uh, the fact that uh, um, 
In Gothic novels, uh, there are apparitions, ghosts, uh, supernatural events that are the real engines of the plots. Whereas in Frankenstein, everything is scientific. Everything is real. So the horror is not in the imagination, but the horror is in reality. Uh, I'm reading Nisha's uh, um, question. How is the concept of God is dead of Nietzsche being explored in a novel? Uh, Nietzsche comes after. So uh, probably he elaborated on the same route, the fact that uh, men want to uh, explain their lives. We all want to know why we live, why we are on this planet, what the purpose of our life is. And uh, uh, we are no longer happy with the idea of a God creator. We want to know more. We want to overcome the limits. We want to um, appropriate prerogatives that have never been ours. So uh, both Victor and Nietzsche's concepts stem from the same root. Thank you. And why does the monster want revenge? Because uh, he feels he has been mistreated. He feels that he has been uh, uh, treated in uh, an in unfair way. And therefore, revenge is only answer to uh, the misbehavior of other people. How is Frankenstein relevant today? Yes, we have already elaborated on this. It's relevant also because of the role of science. Um, I mean, there are a lot of rumors, a lot of conspiracy theories uh, that coronavirus, for example, was lab created because it's too perfect a virus and uh, uh, it could be created, could have been created in the lab to serve as a weapon of mass destruction. So uh, what is the limit of science? Is science uh, uh, always to be joined with ethics? Yes, no, to what extent? This is what we can really learn uh, today. Uh, I mean, if we um, don't consider the uh, result of our actions, then we are doomed to failure the way Victor Frankenstein was. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Are the characters of Walton and Victor Frankenstein similar? Yes, absolutely. Walton, Victor, the creature, they are three fragments of the same broken mirror that reflects the image of Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley projected herself onto Walton, onto Victor, and onto the creature. So the three are more or less the same. They are different declinations, articulations of the same, um, the same being. Uh, because also Walton, uh, as I mentioned before, pushes his crew to a place where nobody had ever been because he wants to be the first one, he wants to be uh, the only one. So his pride, uh, his ambition is enormous. The way the pride and ambitious, ambition of Victor is enormous. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, first of you, first of all, I would like to convey my thanks for giving us your valuable time for us. Ma'am, I have a qu query about uh, Frankenstein. Why does yes. Frankenstein destroy the monster's female companion? Okay. The uh, excuse, the uh, official excuse is that uh, uh, if he had created a female monster, he was afraid that they would have children. I mean, they would have a progeny that would eventually take over the planet. But obviously, I mean, they are dead. They are revived, but they are dead. So it would have been very difficult to think that uh, such 
a possibility may occur. So he probably killed the creature, the female creature, because he saw once again his failure because she was monstrous, she was horrible, she was even more horrible than the creature, the male creature. That, therefore, he was confronted with his own failure. That's why he destroyed the female creature. Uh, that's an interesting question. How does the monster learn to speak? The monster learned to speak the way we learn to speak, by listening to other people. He actually learns everything uh, and even to read by the De Lacy family. So Mary Shelley describes uh, the growth of the creature as if she would have described the growth of any other uh, human being. How does Frankenstein end? Uh, Frankenstein ends with uh, the death of Victor. And as I mentioned before, uh, the creature that says that uh, he will kill himself by throwing himself on a funeral pyre. But this is Percy Shelley's ending of the novel. Mary Shelley didn't want the creature to die. She only wanted the creature to live uh, alone in the desert of the ice and uh, Prosper. Thank you. If you have any other questions or any other curiosity, I'm going to write in the chat box my email address. Please do not hesitate. There you go. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Actually, ma'am, uh, uh, it's a really pleasure to say, as I always uh, say to it to my students, that in this lockdown period, I don't know uh, what good things I have done, but uh, the good people that I have come into their touch. So I'm really. Uh, fortunate to have you all uh, so in this academic arena and whenever i requested uh, for a class uh, for uh, any kind of help so you are you are there always so really it's a great thing to me and now i request uh, triasha uh, chaktaburthi uh, to uh, deliver the vote of thanks to ma'am triasha Ma'am, your voice is really amazing. It's <laughs> so good to hear you. Oh, there is another question. Let me let me answer this first. Uh, Ishel conveys the impression that perhaps the technological advances made. Man become a slave to machines instead of machines being dominated by men. Yes, yes. But this is because when you create something, this is what Mary Shelley says, when you create something without thinking of the result of what you create, when you are short-sighted, when you, you don't see beyond your nose, as we say in Italy, then uh, you're doomed to disaster. And uh, this is exactly what is happening nowadays. So we have created so many factories, uh, but we have also polluted the planet. And now our planet is revolting against us. So this is the very important message that we can still derive from Mary Shelley's uh, works today. Thank you. Triasha, are you there? Triasha? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Good. Okay. Continue. Sorry. Question number two. Always your uh, speech to be. Ma'am, why does Walton Township around? Sorry? 
why does walton uh, turn sheep around uh why does walton i i couldn't grasp the verb Why does Walton? Well, Walton, uh, unlike Victor Frankenstein, will survive because he listened to Victor's words and he understood that he was making a mistake, so he is going backward. He's going back. He's going back to his own country without uh, undermining the health of his crew. So probably this is what you wanted me to, to expand on. So, ma'am, I think uh, Trias is having uh, network issues. Uh, so, I request Nisha Mahapatra, a student, to uh, give the vote of thanks. Nisha, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. You continue, please. Okay, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, I'm Nisha Mahapatra. Uh, I'm a student of uh, PG first semester, Department of English, Manapur College. So I, on behalf of my entire department, would like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to the Honorable Delegate, Dr. Elisabetta Marino, for a wonderful and mesmerizing lecture. Ma'am, thank you so much that uh, you have blessed us with your presence today. And uh, we really feel fortunate enough that we have got the opportunity to hear you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, you. we have stopped. We are uh, ending the session here then with your permission, ma'am. Of course. And thank you so okay. much and take care. Okay. okay. You, you too.